But my guest this morning is Dawn N. Hicks, Tafari Ph.D. She is a native New Yorker, hip-hop feminist, and scholar activist. Dawn N. Hicks, Tafari Ph.D. is passionate about the arts, culture, education, and translating theory into practice. She has served as an elementary school teacher, a curriculum facilitator, a teacher education program coordinator, and an educational consultant for school districts, universities, and agencies across the country. She is also co-founder of the Greensboro Kwanzaa Collective and one of the co-curators of the Black Girls and Women Matter Greensboro Town Hall. Tafari's work focuses on hip-hop, feminism, black boys, and men in academic spaces, critical race theory, and Kwanzaa as a site of resistance. Ladies and gentlemen, our first guest of 2024. Welcome to the Reading Circle Microphones, Dawn N. Hicks, Tafari, Ph.D. Dawn, good morning. Good morning to you. How are you doing today? I'm doing really well now that we got everything connected. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. I am thrilled. And you know what? This is my 23rd year doing this, and I can remember my first year's Something like that would have totally freaked me out. And now I've gotten to the point where it's like I'll stay calm and collected and work it through and figure it out. And things generally tend to work back out. But years ago when the show first started, when I was new at this, that I would have, I would have been in like a conniption fit. Yeah, it's, it's, like the, it's like teaching. You know, when you first start teaching, you're, when you first start anything, <laughs> oftentimes you're really nervous and you don't know how. Mm-hmm. You don't you don't have the plan B, the plan C, and the, you don't have the bag of tricks. But as you become more seasoned and comfortable and confident, you 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 just learn to go with the flow and you learn to make it all work. So it's a beautiful thing. I know that's right. Now you're calling out of the out of North Carolina, correct? Yes. I am in Greensboro, North Carolina right now. All right, Greensboro. I know of Greensboro. I have family in South Boston, Virginia, and Greensville, Green, yeah, where you are, Greensboro, is about an hour and a half, two hours away from where my father's side is. Now, my mother, she's from the North Carolina, so she's from Wilmington. So I have, I actually have an aunt that's listening down in Sunset Beach right now. And so... Hey, <laughs> I know that's right. <laughs> and... Dawn was brought to my attention. I was introduced to Dawn through a long time frame. I just said I was on the air now. This is my 23rd year. And the person that introduced me to Dawn was one of my first guests when I started doing guests back in 2001, 2002. And that's none other than Dr. Ayo Sakai. And Dawn's book is actually published by Dr. Sakai's publishing company, Universal Right Publications, LLC. So Io, Dr. Io, Dr. Sakai, sent me an email saying, I have a great author for you. I'm going to connect you to, uh, and I was like, great. You know, and as it turns out, Dawn wound up being, or winds up being my first guest of 2024. And I am thrilled and excited about it for a lot of different reasons. Because not only is Dawn an educator, Dawn is also a part of the greatest sorority in the world. And that is none other than Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Ski (laughs) Phi. The first and the finest, so it is only appropriate. It makes total sense that I would be your first guest, as as your friend was the first, and mine followed up as the first sorority right after that. So, hello. I know that's right. She has the. If, if for those of you on my email blast list, or for those I've texted, if you notice the colors on it, because she was wearing a green, the military look. She was doing the camouflage green thing. I said, "Oh, I, she's an AKA, so I know what color background I'm gonna put with that." <laughs> so it was like she was wearing the green. I put the pink in the background. So there's all kind of subliminal messaging going on there. But uh, again, I am thrilled to have you on here because the topic that we're going to be talking about. Matter of fact, I'm going to let you kind of. Walk us into how did this all come about? Because as I was saying, usually my first question that I ask is kind of, is this where as a child or a teenager or a youngster, you kind of pictured yourself being in terms of writing a book or becoming an author? Was writing always your thing, like in grammar school, elementary school, middle school, high school? Where did the whole writing thing begin? Wow. I did, I, I did always love writing. I remember in the third grade, 
I grew up in New York City in the Bronx. And I remember one April, it snowed. And we were all like, wow, it's snowing. And I remember, you know, doing an activity in class, and I wrote a poetry. And I'll never forget, the poem ended. So let those church bell rings when it's snowing in the spring, right? <laughs> I remember that. But I, so I've always loved writing, writing as a form of expressing myself, especially through poetry and creative writing. I used to write stories like in a journal, like fictional stories and read them out loud. And I would be that person that's walking and um, talking out loud and kind of writing, but I would be reading what I wrote and, and just, I really enjoyed that. I really enjoyed telling stories. I always did. And so as I grew I think what happens to a lot of people is you, you, in school sometimes, unfortunately, that love, because you have so much forced writing to do, uh, required writing, I, I got out of the love of it until I started working on my doctorate, really. Like, it was, you know, all through college, I still enjoyed writing some, and then I just was like, uh you know, like I said, at different points, I just did not want to write in the same way. And then it was when I, um, no, I'm going to tell you the real story. Huh. <laughs> I, 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 I'm going to sit back and fold my hands over my chest, as I'm going to say, in 1992, right? <laughs> Literally, so I'm on the train. I'm on, like I said, I'm from the Bronx. I'm on the train, probably the two train with me and my homegirls, right? It was probably like Elysia and Khaled. You know, I, I, we were on the train. And I don't remember where we were coming from, but I know we were going home. We were going towards, we were going uptown in the Bronx. And they're sitting, and I'm hang, you know, I'm hanging on to the strap, right? You know, in the train state on the right. subway, we have the, the, the straps you hold on to. And I'm rapping, right? Because when I was about 12, 13, I wanted to be a rapper. Right. right. And, it, and it and it makes sense in a sense, right? Because writing, writing poetry, poetry is rap. And so I wanted to be a rapper, so I'm just I'm dropping bars, right? I'm kicking it <laughs> on the subway. And I remember they, they're cheering me on like good friends do and I'm rapping, rapping, rapping. And th- I noticed this woman watching me. At the time, you know, in retrospect she was old, right? When in my eighteen year old mind, she was old. And <laughs> right. that, I think about her face. She was probably about thirty, right? Mm-hmm. But I remember I'm rapping and then she gets up, the train comes to a stop, she gets up and she comes over mm-hmm. to me and she says, Have you ever read Bell Hooks? And I'm like, No. And she says, Well, she has a book called Sisters of the Yam. You should read it. And then she gets off the train. I didn't know this woman. I had never seen this woman. I have no idea who she is to this day. But she says that to me, and she gets off the train. Now, I'm obedient. So, and this is 1992, so I find a bookstore, probably go to, you know, a bookstore. And I I find this book. I go buy this book because there's something, everything in me is saying, there's a reason that this woman tells me to read this book. That's right. And I have no idea who she is. Total stranger. But again, my mama told me, you respect your elders. And at the time, she looked old to me. So I go by the book. <laughs> I read this book by Bell Hooks, Sisters of the Yam. When I tell you my life was changed. This book is about black women. It's about empowerment. It's about uh, self-discovery. And she put words to things like um, capitalist, patriarchal, racist, sexist, neoliberal i was like oh snap this was salt and pepper was talking about right (laughs) like it started she put these 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 terms on these things that i was already feeling she helped me to verbalize some of the understandings that i had about the world already like literally in salt and peppers um my mic um no 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 the showstopper when they say but douglas and richard won't like it so Come on, Lynn, let's stop the show, right? They're helping me to understand what hip-hop feminism is before hip-hop feminism had um, had a title, right? And Bell Hooks is making sense of the world for me. And so I was on fire after that. You know, I was in college. I I think I was just starting college around that time. And I knew 
that I always wanted to write. If I when I wrote, I wanted to write like her. And when I when I got into my doctoral program, I remembered. And you know, when you read, if you ever read any scholarly articles, they're very. There's a whole lot of pontification going on. Yes. Vocabulary is very dense. Yes. There's all these big um, citations. That's right. Parentheses and all the names. And I remember saying, I hate this. (laughs) I don't like reading this. And who does? And I remember (laughs) saying, I want to write like Bell Hooks. I want to write in a way that my mom could enjoy, that my friends can enjoy, right? Um, And so that Bell Hooks, I think is a large part of of my love for writing. She helped me to love writing again because she wrote in a very conversational way. And it was, and she showed me that you can be educated and smart and, and just talk and just talk to the people, right? You can just talk to the people. You don't have to have these billion dollar vocabulary words and these long strands of citations in order to make sense and to sound smart. And so I think that really helped to bring that love for writing back. And so once I knew, once I, once Bell Hooks gave me permission mm-hmm. <laughs> to write in a way that I enjoyed writing, in a, in a way that was poetic, then I've kind of been on fire since and having a good time. You know what's interesting? Because, see, this is the way I operate. Because, first off, I'm an avid reader. That hence the, the, this show, The Reading Circle. I'm an avid reader. And for me... And I was saying earlier, I think I download a book from Amazon on Kindle, at least one book a day, sometimes two or three, depending if it's a two ninety nine or a five ninety nine or whatever. Mm-hmm. But the same way you had that feeling of, I didn't know this woman from Adam, and yet she threw out a book title, and it drove you to go get it. That's exactly like if, if I'm reading something and an author references another author, or if I see an advertisement, or it hits me in a strange way, or on Twitter, or on Instagram, or whatever... That's how I go and download the book. Now, what's really fascinating, because now I am definitely going to go get, and I realize Bell wrote that for women, but now that book came, because I'm in my doctoral program now, and that book came up last semester. And the person who talked about it said the same thing that you just said, that it was life-changing. So I am going to get that book. I don't know if it's in Kindle version. However, if it's not, then I'll order it and get the paperback or the hard copy. Order. But I and, and I get it. It might be written for women. But I have got to see this book now because this is the second time it's come up within the year. And the person that right. described it said the same thing that you just said. And I'm familiar with Bell Hook's work. I've, I've read something else by her. So, But I got to get this one. This one that you just talked about, The Yam. I got to get that one. Uh, because and that's the way I, that's the way my library builds is by not so much you know recommendations this as it's just how it comes to me just like that book came to you so now that's interesting and there's nothing that you said that was interesting was this whole notion of reading these scholarly articles yes I feel your pain I know exactly what you're talking about because I'm an avid reader and I struggle to get through these scholarly articles I really do um, and and I know what we have to do to you know to earn our degrees or whatever but and it is because we eventually we well you now there you're a PhD so you have to write like that but Mm -hmm. in terms of um so you really didn't start out as a child saying i want to be an author no absolutely not okay and yet uh, say that again i wanted to be a dancer you want to be a dancer okay (laughs) well i cannot tell you how many authors i've had on the show over the 23 year period of time who said, I'm not an author. I'm like, yes, you are. You have a book. <laughs> like, I'm not an author. Like, yes, you are. You have a book. But in any event, so no, I'm, I'm going to backtrack a little bit. Like, what what kind of caused you to go to earn and go after the Ph.D.? Hmm. Well, hmm. I was a teacher, right? So I became a, I, when I was growing up, I knew that, you know, I loved people. I knew I wanted to serve. I knew I wanted to change the world. I, I didn't know how to do that. I used to think I was going to be an attorney, try to put all the bad guys in jail. And, and then um, I fell in love with teaching when I was in high school. I went to Walton High School in the Bronx. Shout out to Walton High School. And I had an awesome teacher named uh, Phyllis Opachinski. She was amazing. And she she taught us how to be teachers, right? She taught us how to write lesson plans and all of that stuff. And in this program, this pre-teaching academy at Walton High School, we actually got to teach lessons. We got to serve almost like teacher assistants, but also teach lessons, and we got paid for it. It was an awesome thing. And so 
at Wilson, then I fell in love with teaching. So I was like, okay, I'm going to go to college and be a teacher. And so I did that. I went to college to be a teacher. It was a long, a long road in college, changed my major like four or five times. It was crazy. But after I graduated, I had ended up majoring in psychology. And after I graduated, I'm like, okay, what, what can I do? I want to help people. And then I went to talk to my aunt, my Aunt Deborah, who was a teacher in Virginia. And I sat at her table, and I'm like, Aunt Deborah, you know, I, I think I'm ready to teach. And she was like, girl, I was waiting for you to say that. And <laughs> picked up the phone and <laughs> called her friend, her best friend, Sharon Wallace Free, who was a, an assistant principal at a school, PSI is 41, in Brooklyn, Brownsville, Brooklyn. And the two of them went ahead and scheduled me an interview for like that Tuesday at 9 o'clock, right? I was like, okay, I guess I just have to not mess this up. That's all I have to do. And so that, um, that set me up for my first teaching experience. And, and so I started teaching, and as I was teaching, I saw what was happening with black boys. I noticed it almost right away, like the conditions that children were facing in schools, that, that black boys were often misunderstood, oftentimes mistreated, oftentimes shoveled into special education and out-of-school suspension, in in different kind of ways. And so I I figured I, as I continued to learn and interact, and, and I was good, right? I, I was good at teaching, right? I was good at reaching children. I realized... Oh, can you hear me? I can. Oh, I'm getting myself back. Okay. And as I'm teaching, I'm realizing that um, I can help other people with this. And so... I kept I kept doing what I was doing. I kept I was a mentor to other teachers and then I moved to Baltimore, taught some more there, went on to get my master's degree and I realized that I was that like I said I started people started calling on me to do consulting work and things like that. And at the time I was married my my ex-husband had a a doctor, he had completed his doctorate and so we started this consulting business. And I noticed that people would call and they would ask for stuff that was my area of expertise, but they wanted the doctor, right? <laughs> they wanted the doctor. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, but that's, you know, I'm, I'm the P12 person. And he was like, yeah, but can we have Dr. Tafari? And I was like, uh, oh, okay. <laughs> but, and so I realized, I was like, you know what, people, I need these credentials because people value them, right? Yes. They sit up, up and listen a little better when you interest those introduce yourself as doctor going so and so and that's a very um surface reason to get it so obviously that wasn't the only reason but as i continued to do my consulting and continued to learn about teaching and learning and and education and culture and how all of these things come together i realized that i had some ideas i realized that i had some some work that I really wanted to do on a deeper level. Like I wanted to do research. And and that's the thing that made me say, maybe it's time for me to do my doctorate because I have some ideas that I really want to explore in a deeper way. I have some information that I want to share um, that I really want to disseminate in a, in a broader way. I really have some things that I want to learn in a, in a more – uh, enriched way. And so maybe it's time for me to do my doctorate. And that's where, and I, then I went about just searching for the right program, right? Because you don't just, there, there's a lot of ed leadership programs, right? I was in, I was in um, Maryland. Where was I? No, I was in North Carolina. Um, there are a lot of ed leadership programs and that wasn't my thing. And I was like, ah, I'm not a, I'm not the, I'm not a principal, right? I, I've been told that I could be a good principal, but that's, that's not my thing. That's my girl Heather's thing, right? Uh, and Rachel and Severin, I'm talking about all my homies. Um, but I, I didn't want to be a principal, and so I kept looking, and I knew that I had a passion for studying culture. I knew I had a passion for teaching and learning and education and how those things tie together. So I found the perfect program um, at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro's Educational Leadership and Cultural Foundations. And I knew then that that was it, right? So it was really about finding the right program, and it was about – believing and understanding that I was ready to do research on a deeper level, to do doctoral work, and because I really wanted to uncover and interrogate what was being said, right, the knowledge that was being produced 
out there. Mm -hmm. That's how I got in. That's how I started. So I told you we had a lot in common. And the fact that you were talking Mm -hmm. about as you were teaching, you noticed what was going on with African-American or black boys. And Mm -hmm. I shared with you in our five minute talk before going on the air that I actually lead an all boy school. It's a leadership school, very Mm -hmm. small, but it's children who are selected from around the district that they're not alternative uh, middle school children. In other words, they're not the bad boys, but they're not the gifted and talented hour either. They kind of fall in the middle. In other words, we the, 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 my school was designed to give kids who probably would do better in a smaller setting. It's not that they didn't have the potential. It's not that they couldn't do, but the opportunity for them to be distracted was a lot higher in a large school. So that's where my school is kind of like a specialty school or what they call a choice school. And it's all male, single gender. And a lot of the things that you were just talking about is exactly what we see on a daily Mm -hmm. basis with our boys. Matter of fact, when the district put it in place, it was kind of like an experiment because there were folks that were seeing that they felt our black boys were being underserved. And, you know, when I say black boys, I'm talking about people of color, Spanish boys, black boys, that they were being underserved. So they said, "Okay, let's pull them out and let's see if they do better. And because my thing is, this this is a tiny school. I I can take 10 times more students if you give me the staff. Um, So it's like Mm -hmm. if you want to give me five, six hundred boys, because right now we're talking 55, 60 boys. You want to give me five hundred boys and the staff? Hey, give it to me. I'll take it because I can see the progress that we're making with the way we're able to teach with the way we're able to interact with them whenever they're not being distracted with girls and this, that, and the other. Um, So what you're talking about as we work our way into your book is critical. And I heard you talking about the whole hip hop thing because that can be infused as well. And now when you start talking bell hooks, um, like I said, I'm going to get that yam book. I'm going to get that before the day is out. (laughs) And the thing is, is right, that keep in mind, so the book was not written to you, but it doesn't mean it wasn't written for you. Correct. Right? Like there could be things in there for you. I think that's where oftentimes we get, we go wrong when we isolate ourselves into thinking, oh, that's for women only. That's for women. I can't listen. We have so much to learn from one another. Yes. Right? We have so much to learn from one another. And, and I think that's how we, we, we grow and we become uplifted when we do dabble in the things that are for one another so that we can hear and get the different perspectives. Right? How you, you will grow from reading that book because you'll be like, oh, snap, this is what the sisters are thinking. Right? And that'll only help you, brother. That'll only help you. <laughs> this is what the sisters are thinking all right now. <laughs> yeah, that will, you right. That will help me. You absolutely right. And right. Or this is what they are dealing with. Let yes. Me be more sensitive. Let me be more thoughtful. Let me be more considerate. Let me, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? A- absolutely. So you know what we're dealing with. And I think black women do that very well. You know, I could not agree with you more. Because... Yeah, we're always thinking about what other people are dealing with, and therefore, and we adjust and we we put things in place so that we can help and support and mm-hmm. and be um, and uplift. Well, not for nothing. I mean, and I, I don't want to go totally off topic because we could spend the next two or three hours talking. But we see what went on with the president at Harvard, with mm-hmm. the President Gay. We see what went on with the sister that committed suicide at the other university because she felt she wasn't being supported by the president. Now they're talking about, you know, but that was with two black women and those two events occurred very close to each other. Matter of fact, if I'm not mistaken, the sister that killed herself with, you know, was an AKA. She was, she actually was a member of my chapter. Really? Not, not right now. When she, she would lived in Greensboro for some while while she was working on her doctoral studies, I believe. I was I we she and I missed one another, um, but we are my much of the, my members of my chapter have been talking about. We actually were just talking about her on Thursday, and we'd be sending something you know a little something to her husband. Absolutely. But I, I'm yeah. saying all this in terms of the as you were talking about the plight of black women. Yeah, and it yeah. is and there. That's from, right, that's exactly where this book is coming from. Bell Hooks, Auntie, um, Auntie Bell, as I right. like to call her. Um, she, she had wrote a book about black men, and, and in that book she said, um, I've been waiting for black men to, to write this book. 
but it hasn't been written, so I'm going to go ahead. She said, I've, I've been given space. I had this idea, and I didn't want to do the work for black men, but it hasn't been done, so I'm going to go ahead and do it. Right? That was one of the first pieces that I wrote about the issues facing black boys and men in schools was a book by Bell Hooks. And so we, we, have, to, we have to do the work. And, and there's, a, there's a, a brother, Tyrone C. Howard, out of, I think he's in, in L.A., UCLA. I can't remember exactly what school he's at. But um, he's one of uh, more prolific scholars when you think about black boys in schools. And, and he says, you know, anybody can do the work when we're talking about black boys and black men. It's just make sure that your, your approach is authentic. Correct. And that it's, that it's real, you know what I mean, and that it's not... Um, arrogant, right? You're not just coming to take up space, but that you're coming to humbly do the work. And that's how I come to this work, humbly. You know, and, and, and you're right in terms of not being arrogant in terms of, because see, that's what it's all about in terms of, of like I said, I always use my school as the example because we truly are doing everything we can to uplift. We, we, we have the, con- and that's what I love about it being so small and us kind of being set apart. We have the conversations with our boys that don't you ever allow anyone to make you feel anything less because of where yeah. you're growing up, where you're coming from and the color of your skin, because it's going to happen and we're going to prepare you for when it happens, but don't you ever allow anyone to make you feel any less because of the color of your skin, because of the city you're growing up in, because you're a male, so forth and so on. So we have those. Mm-hmm. And I want to uh, make sure I throw the sister's name out there because I call, I wanted to call it and I wanted to call it correct. That was Dr. Antoinette Bonnie Candia Bailey. She was the one at Lincoln University in Missouri mm-hmm. who committed suicide and had already expressed her concerns and really nothing was done about it then of course we had president gay up at harvard uh, university that that whole thing and what amazes me when you start talking double standards that you had these two women with the fate that they had and now you have this caucasian man running around the country talking crap that has 91 charges against him so when you start talking double standards, that's what we start. That's what we're preparing our boys for. And I'm working my way to your book. Listening audience, if you just joined me, I hope you've been with me since six. Uh, but certainly, if you haven't been with me since six, certainly since seven, as my guest this morning is Dawn N. Hicks Tafari, Ph.D. Or we could say it the other way, Dr. Tafari. Uh, so that's my guest this morning. We're talking about we're working our way up to her book, The Journey of Kamau Miller, Hip hop composite counter stories for black men teachers, even though the last couple of minutes we've been talking about black women, her work is on black male teachers. Now, I cannot tell you as the principal of a school, of an urban school, how significant it is to have teachers who look like the students that they serve. Now, like she said, that's not saying that someone of a different persuasion cannot do the work because they can. But I can't tell you the significance of having someone who looks like you standing in front of you. Mm-hmm. So let's mm-hmm. let's get into how did you come to this whole concept of the journey of Kamau Miller? Ooh, how did I come to this concept? So, like I said earlier, um, I, I was teaching in New York City in Brooklyn, and I noticed. The, the disregard that there was for black boys. I had a student, uh, Chris, and I just, I was having trouble with him, and, and I was told, well, go ahead and refer him for special ed. And I was like, well, why, why? <laughs> you know, like, I, I just, I'm just having some behavioral issues with him. Why does he need to go to special ed? Like, what, what's that about? And so, but the answer was so ready, right? And so I, I just paid attention to him, and I did some creative activities, and I, I developed a stronger relationship with him. And I was like, okay, this boy is smart. There's no reason for me to refer him to special ed. And I noticed that that was happening, that that happened more times than not. And so, again, as, I've tr- as I moved through my own career, that was something that I continued to see. And then I started to ask, my question then was, well, what's going on with the black boys? Why are the black boys struggling in the way that they're struggling? Why are they at the bottom of of all the of all the levels, right? Why are they struggling so much? And then I said, Well, damn it! Oh, excuse me. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> there are no black male teachers, right? I said, this, Where are the? They don't see themselves in school. They don't see them. 
themselves. They don't see school as a safe place. You see, if you think about it, if you go to a party, the first thing you do is look around. And when you look around, you're looking for your people, right? You're looking for your people. You're like, who do I know here? Who all, you know what they say, who all over there? You're looking for the people you know who look like you, who are familiar to you. And if, and if you don't see anybody you know or nobody who looks like you even, oftentimes you may leave that party or you may circle the room real quick and then you leave it. But schools are the same way. Black boys are in school and there's 1.2% of teachers across the country are black men. And so they're in this space where, yes, they have black women who, who make up you know, a little bit more than that, but white women are 85% of teachers across the country. That is correct. And, yeah, and again, you know, you have some you have some awesome teachers out there who do wonderful things for, for children of, of all uh, races, colors, and creeds. However, you know, people want to, children want to see more than half, right? That this, this There's this misnomer that black folk are a minority. I think we all should know at this point in 2023, we are not the minority. Black and brown children make up more than half of the public school population across the country. More than half. No, you're absolutely right. And the minority right. is definitely continuing to become a majority in this country. And so minority, when we say the term minority, we're talking about power, not about numbers. Correct. That's an excellent point. That is an excellent point because I, first off, I refuse to be considered or call myself a minority, but that is an excellent point in terms of, we're not talking numbers, you're talking power. You're absolutely, as a matter of fact, that's the first time I've heard it put that way. I'm going to steal that from you, or, but I'll give you credit because I know how, I know how we, we do with, uh, you know, accreditation and all that, but I'm going to give you credit for it. But you're absolutely right. I, I have not thought of it that way and, and that succinctly. That no, no, we're not talking minority in number because you're right, and in, in, in where we are now, and that's part of the problem because folks know that. That's where the fear is coming in, in terms of oh, so at some point the numbers are also going to translate to power, and that's what they're fighting to make sure <laughs> right. that that doesn't happen. But you're absolutely right; we're not minority in number. If any, and I know Bill Clinton, Bill Clinton said it years ago. By 2050, it was going to be a total changeover. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and so it's really and that's why we use terms like minoritized community or like you said, underserved. You know, there's all kinds of other terms that we use as far as um, even when we're describing people, you know, communities from a, from a school academic perspective. Absolutely. Um, but I just I just um, so I, I noticed that that black male teachers were so less in number. And I just, then I started to ask the question, well, where are the black male teachers? Why are black boys not becoming teachers? Well, first of all, because black boys don't see Correct. black men teachers, right? So there's a conundrum. They don't see black men teachers. So they don't even think of education, of teaching as a viable career option because they don't see themselves there. Black boys want to be rappers. Black boys want to be football players. They want to be professional athletes. Why? Because they see black men there. Black men do it successfully. So that's what they want to be because that's where they see themselves. So they don't see themselves in education. They see black women in education. They see white women in education. They even see white men in education, right? So that's who they think can become teachers. So I started to ask myself, why don't black men become teachers? And those answers came to me very quickly, right? Black men uh, oftentimes are not becoming teachers, one, because of the pay, right? Teaching is a feminized position right? because teaching is was quote unquote shifted in the 1800s late 1800s to becoming a woman's job right when men were fighting at war women were teaching the maid and you know the the young girl they taught her enough so that she can teach the younger kids and quote unquote it became this push that oh women have natural maternal instincts therefore they make better teachers like this was literally a whole paper that was written in the 1800s to actually professionalize teaching and make give women a place to work. And I get it, right? Women needed a place, but they have no idea <laughs> what they've done, what they did when they did that. Um, this was uh, Catherine Beecher. And so, remember I had, uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin, Harriet Beecher Stowe? Correct. Her sister, um, her sister is actually one, the one who did the work to professionalize teaching for women. And so, when they did that, then folks said, well... 
Well, what we'll do since she's a, a young since she's a young woman, she's a maiden. She doesn't need to live on her own, right? Because women, Correct. there's no way the women in the 1800s can live on their own. They'll go and stay with a family in the community, and they will be the teacher, the school maiden. And so, if I, if you're providing me housing and you're providing my meals, I don't need a big old salary, right? So Correct. we'll give you a little supplement for you, a little stipend, and you'll be fine. And you can use that. You can send that home until you get a husband, and then you'll stop teaching, and then you'll now be the property of your husband, right? Correct. So women, so women didn't, so teaching garnered this small salary for that reason. But it didn't keep up with the times. Correct. Right? So as teachers, obviously, teachers are not all maidens now. Teachers are all kinds of folk, all ages. But the concept, the ideology that teachers don't need, uh, dare I say it, a livable wage Correct. has stayed in this country, right? Teachers are funded last as far as salaries. And so if you want to be head of household, <laughs> right. teaching is not, the, is not the career you typically aspire to. And especially black men, right? You have not just gender, so they're trying to be head of household, but black men are all also dealing with all of the vilification that comes from society. Correct. So black men are like, well, look, I'm not going to get paid. I need to get paid so I can take care of my family. Correct. So I'm not going to choose teaching. So black men stay away from teaching for that reason, right? And then there's those, those black men who say, you know what? I love children. I love teaching. I want to change the world. I want to do this. And then people look at them and they say, what's wrong with you? Well, like, see, I fell in that camp, and I'll be very transparent at the time, because I actually was what they call alternate route, where my first 15 years of my career I spent in corporate. I was working uh-huh. in corporate America for the first 15 years, but my heart was always in education from the beginning. And whenever mm-hmm. I left my corporate job to go to education, my salary cut in half, literally. Because at the time, I was making something like sixty, sixty-five thousand dollars $65,000 a year. When I started teaching, I went to thirty-seven. Look at that. Insane. And what Insane. you exactly and what you just described is exactly what people were saying. What's wrong with you? Like, are you out of your mind? You you went from that salary to that salary because you want to work with these kids? Yes. Uh, and, and going back to what you were saying in terms of the thinking behind the salary, you're absolutely right. And then it carried over. Not only would you live with a family member, but as the teacher, as a female, you're the second income because your husband is the breadwinner. So therefore, we're not going to up the salaries because you're the second income. Your husband is making. And so that's what carried through. And that's, that's what has suppressed the salaries. Right. Um, right. And, then they, and then they look at you and they say, so then they ask you, why are you taking this salary cut? And then they want to know, then they start to look at your character, right? And they say, well, what's wrong with you that you're willing to do women's work? <laughs> right. And then society starts to problematize homosexuality. Oh, you must be gay because you like working with children. Or even, or uh, take it a step further, then they say, you must be a pedophile. Oh, yes. Over here with these children. So then they start to look at you and scrutinize you. And brothers, the brothers I know, like, look, I ain't got time for that foolishness. They right. Like, uh-uh. So they just they again, so then they turn away from education because they don't want to deal with that. And then there's the, the brothers who say, okay, forget it. I don't care what people say about me. I'm a teach. I don't care what the salary Correct. is. I want to teach. And then they go into schools and we treat them like the janitor. Correct. We say, oh, Mr. Mr. Medley, can you get my boxes for me? Oh, Mr. Medley, can I send John to your class because he's acting up? Mr. Medley, can you come talk to my kids because they won't be quiet? Like we teach, we treat black men when they do come into our schools like they're the, like they're, all of them are the lead disciplinarians. Oh, absolutely. When I first, when I first was promoted into administration, I was working at a school in a better part of the city. And one day, and at that point I was vice principal. I had gotten promoted. I left teaching and moved up into vice principal. So we had, you know, duties outside to monitor and watch the playground and so forth and so on. So one day a black parent came to, she was a female black parent. And she says, and she started laughing as she said it, she says, because she was somewhat shamed, but she said, Mr. Medley, I have to apologize to you. And I said, for what? I really, I didn't really know the lady. She said, I have to apologize. I said, why? She says, I see you standing out here every morning. I didn't know you were the vice principal. I thought you were the big black security guard. Mm-hmm. Now, this came from a black woman. This didn't come from a white woman. This came from a black woman. But I'm saying all that to say that's just how socialized we are. Yep. 
Yep, the big black security guard. Mm-hmm. So that's what I say. All these things. That, oh, that's why I knew we were going to have a good conversation this morning because all yeah. these things are true. We don't have to make these up. This is reality. This is what is happening. And at this point in 2024, we are education is evolving to the point where we are in a teacher shortage because this is the other thing that you get in terms of well, why don't you have more black men teachers? Oh, we can't find any qualified black male teachers. Yeah. Education is not sexy anymore. They have made it so unsexy. Students do not want to be teachers anymore because they figured it out. At least when I was younger, it probably, you know, you or my age, it was still like, oh, teaching is a noble profession. You're going to be a teacher and you help the children. I believe the children are the future, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's right. You wanted to be teachers. But nowadays, these young people have figured it out. They'd be like, uh-uh, they, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, y'all getting hoodwinked. They get y'all in there. They right. Y'all like that. They, children see how teachers are treated. Correct. They, see, they read, they hear, they understand that teachers are not paid well. And so they're like, why would I do that? There's no, there's absolutely no reason. Especially mm-hmm. we have to also think about how opportunities have changed, right? Correct. It used to be in the, you know, when we think 70 years ago, it was girls became teachers and boys became preachers. Correct. That's what you did. This is what you did. You're going to go to college. You're going to be a teacher. Or if you don't go to college, then you can be a secretary. If Correct. you're really smart, then you can be a nurse, right? That's how. That's what girls were taught back then, right? But now, honey, I can do whatever I want. There's so many. I can start my own business. I can work for Google. I can work. I can do, you know, all kinds of different things. The opportunities are endless. And so we don't have to... Um, but we're not funneled into teaching or preaching in the same way that we used to be, right? And like I said, and just the attack, the constant attack on teachers, the constant changing is if it's not um, uh, every student succeeds, it's uh, no child left behind, it's the race to the top, it's the, it's the policies are constantly changing, the Correct. rules are constantly changing, the benchmark is constantly changing. People are tired. The curriculum is constantly changing. People are talking about education who have no education background. Correct. And have no idea what happens in classrooms and swear that they know. And these are people making these policies. That's what aggravates. Now, you're going back to how teachers teachers are treated. That's what aggravates us. You have folks who've never stepped foot in a classroom other than when they were a student who are making policies, who have no idea what it's like to be a teacher or to be an administrator. So then you have this whole notion of, and you just tapped on it when we were talking about the various policy changes, you have this whole notion of these standardized tests wherein everything, for the most part, is pegged on that to the point wherein a teacher can be considered not a good teacher because of what that bank of children did on a standardized test and their evaluations and everything. And I, I have big problems with that. I'm a little, I'm, I might be a little bit different thinker as a principal, but I have big problems with how we use standardized testing and the evaluation system to determine who is and who is not a good teacher. Because I know for a fact, my children learn, they may not be able to display it on one of these standardized tests, but if you were to engage them in conversation or if you were to engage them in a project or if you were to get, they show you just how much they learned and they would see just how much the teacher taught. But just because the child does not perform the best on a standardized test. And I even question, well, what makes you all feel like your questions are the be all end all. What, what makes you all feel like the information that we are looking for to be answered on a standardized test is the be all end all. And yet that's kind of how we operate. So I'm going back to, again, what you were saying about why particularly black males may not go into teaching because it could be looked at as high aggravation, low pay. Right. Exactly. High aggravation, low pay. And who, well, how does make that make sense? Like, right. Why would I purposefully choose a job, a career that's high aggravation, high stress, right? Underappreciation, right? Overwhelm and and low pay. Why would I purposefully choose that? And so, of course, so and then, of course, you know, here we go it, about the people who choose to go into education. And so, black men are like, "Nah, I got other choices. I'm gonna go make this money over here." <laughs> right. <laughs> So we, so we saw that. So I didn't I didn't want to write a book about that. I didn't want to do that study because I was like, that, that information is already out there. I said, you know what I want to talk to? I want to talk to the 1.2%. Correct. 
I want to I want to find out why black men do teach. That was my research question. Why do men? What are the what are the life experiences that prepare a black man for the school? And more importantly, I wanted to know what hip hop had to do with it because I'm from the Bronx, right? right. I, I used to want to be a rapper, right? Um, and so I wanted to know how does hip hop and growing mm-hmm. up as part of the hip hop generation impact your thoughts about your your identity development, but and also your your pedagogy, how you teach, what you do in the classroom. What does hip hop have to do with all of that? And that's what I set out to learn was why black men teach and what does hip hop have to do with it. And Kamal Miller is the is the result of that. Like what I what I did was and I did this very I'm a critical race theorist. I'm gonna throw that word out there. That's the word that everybody wanna be crazy about. So I love saying it. I'm a critical race theorist. And so in critical race theory, uh, Derek Bell writes with this unapologetic creativity, right? The idea is he again he wants to write in a way that black folk can love and appreciate. He wants to write in a way that it, that really highlights the lived experiences of Black people and highlights how race impacts our our lives and our livelihoods. And so, what I did with this work, which is different than a traditional a book that shares people's experiences, is I did interview nine Black male elementary school teachers from different parts of the country. And then I took their stories, their life stories, what they shared with me. I laid them out, printed, right? I'm old school. I printed them and color-coded with markers and colored pencils, and I looked for the themes. And then what I did was I created a composite character. Kamal Miller is a composite character, meaning that Kamal Miller is a fictional character who is based on these nine black men that I actually, real men, who I interviewed for this. Ah. And so, yes. And so what we did, so what we do then is you have Kamal Miller who embodies and has the characteristics of these men. And then we find him in different situations in the book. So the book reads like a novel. Right. And so Kamal Miller is sitting and getting interviewed. Right. We we see him at the barbershop. We see him playing basketball with his homies. We see him in the airport. We see him at, at a PTA meeting talking to a parent. We see him on a date. And in each of these fictional settings, um, fiction, let me not say settings, because the settings are actually real places. The fictional situation, the, the, he's engaging with other people. He's engaging with other black men, whether they're parents, whether they're teachers. There's only one story where the, the, uh, the opposing character, so to speak, is a woman, right? But in each of these stories, the dialogue that comes out in these in their interactions, in their exchange, is the actual transcript data from the men that I interviewed. So when you read Kamal talking, you're hearing this black male teacher that I interviewed, these nine. And and so it's weaved together in a way to make it interesting and engaging, but the data is real. The words that he's saying, the words that his his colleagues, so for instance, there's one where he sits down and he's getting his hair cut and the barber starts talking and he's like, hey man, so what you doing here? What do you do? Oh, I'm a teacher. You a teacher? Why do you do that? Right? So they start having this great conversation and he starts talking about his experience teaching and the boys he teaches and why he decided to be a teacher. And that stuff, that meat in the book is, again, these real life stories of these men that I interviewed. So I did not make any of that up. It's what we call a fictionalized narrative. It reads like a novel, but you're getting real life stories. It's almost like, um, I guess, like on Lifetime, those biopics right. based on a story. But again, the dialogue that you hear, when you hear Kamal talking, when you hear him talking to Jerry or Diane or, or London, he, the stuff that they're saying, you're, you're learning about the lives of these nine men I interviewed. And it's it's just so fun. I wrote my first composite counter story, I believe, in 2016, and I published it in a journal article, and it just got such great, great um, feedback. And I just was like, I want to do a whole book of these. And so I've been working on this since then, uh, pulling together these um, counter stories, creating them to help fill out the, a year in the life of Kamal Miller. Right. One of the things that I did that was really uh, fun for me is Kamal is 
the name that I had chosen um, by her, my ex-husband and I when we had a son. Well, we never had a son. <laughs> <laughs> right. And said, so it only made sense that, so Kamal was like my baby, right? I birthed him. And so I gave him that name. And Miller is my mother's maiden name. And so okay. All the names, yeah, all of the names in the book are my people, my ancestors, current living, you know, they're all my people. So you're getting to know my family as well when you read the book. So that's how I named her. Because obviously I wouldn't use the names of the men I actually right. studied, right? Because that would be violating their confidentiality. But um, this is my love story to black men teachers because I just, I feel like their voices need to be amplified, right? I don't give them a voice because they have voices, right? But I, I want to make sure that people know their stories. I want to make sure that people know that black men love. Correct. Black men love, that black men love children. Correct. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with a black man saying, I love children. I want to work with children. There's nothing wrong with a black man hugging a child that Correct. needs to be hugged. Right? I want people to know that black men feel, right? That they that they have feelings and emotions and Correct. Their feelings get hit. Right? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> See, you you're going you're talking my talk because like in my school, again. Matter of fact, there's a book. There's a, it's, it's an old book, too. But the title of the book, and I have some of my staff members, some of our team members are listening. Uh, big shout outs to you, Miss Clifford and uh, Karen and a, f- a couple of people from the school are, are tuned in. So they know what I'm saying. I'm not making this up. There is a book. It's titled Good Morning Class. I Love You. And the premise of the book is that's one word we don't hear a lot in schools, but we ought to. So in my school, the men and the women have no problem telling the kids that we love them. And because a lot of the kids that we serve may, and now a lot of them do, because I do hear them when they dropped off in the morning, I might hear a parent say, I love you, this, that, and the other. But a lot of our kids don't hear that. They are not affirmed. They're not uh, encouraged. So uh, in many instances, you will hear any of the men or the women telling the child at the end of class or when they're talking to them or if they've, even if they've had to chastise them, they'll tell them, I love you. And so you're absolutely right. Men do feel. I think in many instances, men's feelings kind of get discounted and disregarded. Absolutely. And then when you start talking about now a male teaching, because I'm going to read from the back of the book in a minute. But um, I had this conversation the other day with my, my assistant superintendent, who is a black male. And we were talking the other day about how this job offers us the opportunity to leave a legacy. Yes. We get to leave. I had an experience the other day where one of my former students, his son is an eighth grader in my school now. So at the grade that I taught this child at, I now have his child. And he came to the school the other day. He came to talk to his son. And when he got ready to go, we were talking. He turned around and said, Mr. Medley, I want to tell you something. I said, what's going on? He says, if it had not been for you forcing me down to that little office in the basement and forcing me to write in the journal, I would not write as well as I do today. Mm. My secretary, she almost teared up. I could see her face. She was about to tear. I almost teared up for that matter. But he said, had it not been for you, and this is going back into like 2000, 2001, 2002. Had it not been for you forcing me down into that office and forcing me to write in that journal, I would not be the writer that I am today. And he went on to tell me the job that he's doing, so forth and so on. That made my day because we have the opportunity to leave a legacy. And secondly, something that you said early on, a lot of times our kids, girls and guys for that matter, may not aspire to go into teaching because like you said, particularly for the boys. They don't see black men doing it. Thank God in my school, they do see black men doing it. But excellent point that maybe if more black males were in the classroom, and this is the other thing too, and and I'm going to read from the back of the book. Not only are we talking about black male teachers in the upper grades, we're talking about black male teachers, because in your book, Kamau is a third grade teacher. We're talking about black male teachers in kindergarten, first grade. Right, right. And And let me say that because... What I learned as I started to do some research about black men in education, black men teaching, the majority of them, the majority of that 1.2% are upper grades. They are middle grades and they're secondary because they want to teach subjects, right? They're concerned about people 
thinking they're doing something to the little kids. And so they teach bigger kids. That's that's where most men go. And that's specifically why I was like, I want to talk to these brothers who decide to teach pre-K. I want to talk to these brothers who teach first, second, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, exactly for that reason, because we know the impact. Is for, and also as a lifelong educator, I know the impact the developmentally Correct. that having um, teachers of different types of those real positive, critical, sensitive learning periods Correct. that are occurring early on in a child's development. So I wanted to really look at those men who are focused on that time there. And, and let me get it, and hip-hop makes the world go around. So I know that's right. How do, we, how, do we, how do the meanings of words of hip-hop music come to life? For well, us? I'll tell you what, my um, middle school... Mm-hmm. ELA teacher, and she's an African-American female. She has her students and six, seven, eight, they deconstruct the message. And it is amazing how the words in the message, and that song was back like in 1984. The words in the message are still applicable in 2024. Absolutely. Absolutely. I use it in one of my courses. Yep. <laughs> so I'm going from the back of the book. The Journey of Kamau Miller. Hip-hop composite counter stories for black men teachers is a compelling and deeply significant book that delves into the life of Kamau Miller, a determined third grade teacher hailing from New York City. Set in the gritty backdrop of the Edmoral projects in the Bronx, the author offers readers an intimate glimpse into Kamau's world as he grapples with the unique struggles of being a black male teacher. The profound influence of hip-hop culture and the ongoing quest for self-discovery. The book intricately weaves themes of identity, education, community, and empowerment while paying homage to the legacy of Derek A. Bell. The journey of Kamau Miller not only honors the resilience and strength of black male educators, but also amplifies the countless voices that are overlooked and unheard. It offers an inspiring and transformative reading experience, illuminating the intricate complexities of life, love, and the relentless pursuit of making a profound impact in the realm of education. With this unapologetically creative approach, this work captivates readers with its accessible, engaging, and thought-provoking storytelling. It stands as a tribute, all right now, to black male teachers, celebrating their experiences and advocating for change and progress in the field of education. Now, that's from the back of the book. So I applaud you for spotlighting and highlighting African-American male teachers. Are you familiar with uh, Dr. Umar Johnson? Are you familiar with his work at all? Yes, sir. (laughs) Mm-hmm. ADAC, his definition for ADAC. Exactly. <laughs> because you were talking earlier about the the high percentage of classification of black male students. And a lot of that stems from a Caucasian teacher not understanding that what that child doing is doing is more so cultural or just how this child is being raised or opposed to what's going on in something mental. But it's real. Sometimes it's gender based, right? Sometimes it's gender based. Correct. Black women not seeing, not understanding why you can't sit down. Correct. Why you won't sit down. Schools are based, schools are feminized settings. Boys are not designed to sit still for six hours. Go ahead. Won't let that happen. Go ahead. Go ahead. And I'm saying go ahead because, again, I I use my school as the reference. (laughs) We let our kids lay on the floor if they want to. Our boys can lay on the floor. If that's where you, as long as you're doing your schoolwork, we have standing tables, tables that we raise up that they can stand and work. They can sit on the floor on a pillow or go sit in the corner. We don't mandate that they have to be in their desk. See, that's what I'm talking about in terms of our school being kind of like ordained or specialized or a little bit different from the rest of the schools in the district because somebody might very well walk in and say, what the heck is going on here? Why is that child on the floor? He learning. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I, my classroom, when I taught in Brooklyn and in, in Baltimore, my principal would walk in there and be like, just shake her head and walk right out. I don't know what's happening in Dawn's room, but I, could be them alone I think learning is happening, but it's looking crazy in there. Because I'm going to let you, I'm going to let you be embodied. 
right? Bell Hooks has another book called Teaching the Transgress. And in that book, she talks about the role that love, Eros, plays in the classroom, right? About how it's an embodied process. Yes. If children feel good, they learn better, right? Think about that. And so why would we force them to sit upright on this hard chair? Them chairs are hard. <laughs> you know what children do chairs? Think about how many schools have cushioned chairs or comfortable chairs. Sit upright in this hard chair, and now you've got to learn. That sounds fun. Not at all. I'm going to do everything else except for learn. And that's because exactly what happens. About that. that sounds fun. I have a friend, my good, good, good friend, Shaka Rawls, is the principal of an all-boys Catholic school, high school, in Chicago, on the south side of Chicago. And it's predominantly black. Interesting, um, white flight has changed the face of the school over the years. But it's predominantly black, all boys, Catholic high school in Chicago. So I want to put you two in contact as well. Because yes. it, it, I visited his school and the love, the magic in that school is just really amazing at how he's able to do things that are really gender focused. And it's a little different than what... Um, than what you would see in a mixed gender school. You know, and you hear some of that. You, you'll hear about some of that of gender, gender specific classes in the book as well, because one of the men I interviewed definitely, he was, a, he had become a school administrator and he talks about that, about the difference of teaching an all boys class versus a mixed gender class. Correct. Yeah. And I tell you, I've had that. This is my fifth year at the school and I've led multiple schools within the district and they were mixed gender. This is my first single gender. And it is definitely a different and rewarding experience. I mean, if I get another kid 20, 30 years from now, tell me, Mr. Medley, if it hadn't have been, you know, something you said in one of our morning meetings, because that's another thing. We every morning I get to address the entire school. They they get more face time with their principal. I know they wouldn't get it in the bigger schools. Every morning wow. we have a morning meeting where I can get in there and preach and teach and everything else. And, you know, it's kind of like that's what sets the tone for their day. So, you know, I get a kid 20 years from now, come back and say, you know, it was something you said in one of those morning meetings is why I'm doing this today or somebody you brought to the school that well, talked to us. Because uh, prior to COVID, and I'm getting, we're getting ready to close down in a couple of minutes, but prior to COVID, I had like two or three guest speakers in a week. And I am an AV geek. When I tell you I love aviation, I love aviation. So one of my guests was the pilot. And when I had a captain from United Airlines come in, and when he came in, I was worse than the boys. <laughs> That excitement, they need to see that excitement. They yes. need to see that that kind of stuff, that adults get excited too, and that you don't have to stop being, you don't have to stop loving life when you grow up. Correct. And so when we, we teach children that, that that fire, that passion is supposed to dwindle. That's okay for children. When you get an adult, you're supposed to be all serious. No. Correct. You see me to school because, oh my God, a pilot? A real pilot? <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Why not? Well, it was like this young man was young enough to be my son when he was a captain. Because when he first walked in, I said, what are you, co-pilot? He looked at me and gave me this look like, no, I'm the captain. And at yeah. that point, that's when he explained the bars to me on the uniform, like four stripes as captain, three stripes as first officer, so forth and so on. I was like, man, you go ahead. I mean, young brother, I mean, he was captain. I asked him, I said, well... Do you ever get, because you're young and black, do you get folks walk on the plane and be like, mm, I don't know if I want to be on this plane? Now, he says, yeah, sadly, I get it from other black people. I get that more from us than I do from from white folks. But uh, it was, it was like I said, I was worse than the kids because I was just what you just said. Oh, my God. And he came in uniform, too. He came with the hat and the shoes, the everything. Oh, I love it. So I was in my glory. Well, I tell you, we definitely going to have to stay in touch. I will, I'm going to text you my school's website. If you haven't looked on it already, I'm going to text it to you. But I definitely want to be in touch with that other principal of the Catholic school. We have to do some networking. And I am definitely want to have you back on because we can continue the conversation. But I have had Dr. Sakai was absolutely right. She said, <laughs> you two. She said, you two got the same energy. You are going to love each other. Matter of fact, I just texted her and said, you are right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, that woman is something special. She's something special. That she is. Yeah. Uh, again, the book is published by Dr. Sakai's company. She is the CEO 
of yes. Universal Right Publications, LLC. She has a partnership with Sage Publishing. And, mm -hmm. I mean, she's getting it done. She's getting it out there. And then she brought us together. I have a few more authors of hers that I'm going to get on. But this is what I do, Dr. Tafari. <laughs> Dawn okay. N. Hicks Tafari, Ph.D. The last few minutes, the last five minutes of the show, I give you the opportunity to promote. You can promote anything you'd like. Shout out anybody you like. The only thing you cannot do is say a dollar amount. That's the only thing you can't do. That's the only prohibition is that you cannot mention a dollar amount. Whatever your services are or whatever you do, you all work that out once people get in contact with you. But in terms of contact information, book signings, anything you want folks to know, I'm going to shut the mic off and you have the opportunity to promote and then we're going to be out. All right. Well, thank you. So I want people, first of all, to get the book. Um, this book, again, it's my love letter to black men teachers. And so this book is for black men teachers and it's for black men and it's for people who love them. So if you fall into any of those categories, you should be reading this book. If you know a black man, you should be reading this book. Because, again, not every character in the book is a teacher, right? But Kamau is, and he interacts and engages with other men. And so these beautiful conversations, you just learn so much about the layers of black men. So you need to get this book. You can get the book on the UWP website, UWP Books. If you just Google UWP books, <laughs> you'll be able to get it. UWPbooks.com. <laughs> yes, UWPbooks.com. You can look for the journey of Kamal Miller. It's a bright yellow cover. That's right. It's beautiful artwork by my good sister's friend, uh, son, Anwar Wilson, does that cover art for me, that image of Kamal. I sat and talked with him, and he just brought it to life. And I mean, I cried when I saw his image. And so... Follow me on Instagram, love, eat, build, love, eat, build, like love, right? You got to love, love one another, eat mindfully and build community along the way. So that's, that's my social media platform. I'm on LinkedIn, Dawn N. Hicks Safari, PhD as well. And on Facebook, Dr. Dawn Hicks Safari. So follow me and see what I'm doing. Um, I would love to come. I want to come and visit schools. I love I love children. I love working with teachers. So I do a lot of professional development and training, especially around things like DEI and culturally relevant and sustaining teaching. And, and so um, I'd love to come to your schools. I'd love to come and give a talk at your conference or for your, your organization, and whether it's a, with the book or not around the book. But right now, where I just want this book to be read. I just want these men to to be heard in such a beautiful and meaningful way. That's what it's all about right now. Kamal Miller is, is everything. He lives, he thrives, he loves. And I think that's the most important thing, that this book is about love. Mm -hmm. It's about love. And we want everybody to know that. Well, I know that's right. Because as, as, as Michael Jackson can say, I'm a lover, not a fighter. Mm -hmm. And in terms of what we promote at my school, some of the first things you'll see walking in the door – centers around the word love. Uh, you'll see it in our messaging. You'll see it in our posters. You'll see it in terms of how we interact and talk with each other. As I said, I have men in my school. Uh, my guidance counselor, uh, do I male teachers have no problem with telling these boys, whether it's in eighth grade or third grade, son, I love you. Right. right. And so right. you're absolutely right in terms of being able to spotlight how and for the males, because, again, going back to the nurturing and, the, you know, for, for women, this that, and the other, that's almost kind of like, for the most part, a given. But for to hear a man say, because that's the other thing, like I said, we got to I got to have you back so we can continue the discussion in many of our homes. The child may hear the female say I love you, but they may never, ever hear the male say the father say I love you. So just the fact that they're coming to a school that men are saying that, and we're not talking, as Dr. King can say, there is a difference between Eros, uh, Filio, and, and you know, um, what's, what's the one where it's everybody, all of us together? Um, agape. That's what I was looking for. There's a difference between Agape, Filio, Eros, and all of that. Because everybody always goes to Eros. Everybody thinks we're talking sexual or romantic love. We're not talking that. We're talking that we love you as a human being. We love you particularly as a person who looks like me. Mm. Yeah. 
Absolutely. So, so, yeah, I'm definitely going to have you back at some point throughout the year. Please do. It'll be exciting. And if you're in the New York area, if you come from the New Jersey area, please let me know. And you all, by all means, welcome to visit my school. If you're ever up in that New York, you're from New York, so you know the area. So if you're ever up this way, uh, give me a jingle, give me a holler, send me a text, whatever. And yes, I followed you on all your social media sites. Uh, So I will be keeping up with what you're doing. (laughs) All right. But I thank you so much for joining this morning. Dr. Sakai. What a great, great conversation. It was. I enjoyed it immensely. Dr. Sakai, thank you so much for, she's listening. So thank you so much for introducing us. And again, I'm going to have her back on the air again. All right, Dr. Tavari, have a wonderfully blessed day and week. And I will definitely be in touch with you. You will get a copy of this. And you can, once you get the links, you do what you want with it. It's going to be in my YouTube channel as well as an MP3 link. And once you receive those, they're yours. I love it. Thank you so much. Thank you. you Wonderful start to my Saturday. I know that's right. All right. Take care now. Take care now. All right.